We're Matt and Cheryl with We're in the Rockies and the whole purpose of our channel is to help you have an amazing trip to the West. So in this video, we're gonna talk about how to plan a trip to Glacier National Park. We're gonna cover things to do, where to stay, where to eat, how to get around, accessibility, and even some road trip ideas. We both grew up in families that took us to the national parks. Now we've been married for 20 years and we love to take our children and both pairs of our retired parents. I'm a severe special education teacher and I've done that for 24 years and Matt used to teach history at the local university, but now he gets to help people travel to the West by writing detailed itineraries and making some really fun audio guides. And today we want to invite you into our home to help you plan your trip to Glacier. All right, we're in our living room now. We're getting comfortable here. A lot of people tell us they get a notepad when they watch this video. So that's what we'd encourage you to do. Get ready to take some notes. And we're gonna talk about Glacier. Glacier is one of the most majestic places on earth. It is really, really beautiful. There are tall snow-capped peaks, U-shaped glacially carved valleys with lakes. There are beautiful wildflowers all over the place. Colorful, white, red, yellow, green. Uh, the lakes are turquoise blue. It is really just one of God's best creations. In fact, we went to Europe last summer for three weeks and we actually got to go to the Alps. And I'm telling you, when I sit and think about beautiful places I've been, my mind always goes to Glacier National Park. It just captured my heart. But one of the challenges of traveling to Glacier is it's really big, it's really remote, you have no service on your cell phone, Glacier has the shortest travel season in the West, probably. Three million visitors visit the park every year, and they're pretty much scrunched into about three months of time, July, August, and September. All right, so let's just give you a little overview of Glacier National Park. Glacier is located in Montana, northern Montana. It actually overlaps the Canadian border, and that little portion is a national park in Canada called Waterton Lakes National Park, which we encourage you to visit if you visit Glacier. Those two parks, are kind of combined into Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. It was the first international peace park in the world. The elevation of Glacier is about 3,000 feet in the valleys, about 6,600 feet at Logan Pass, which is the tallest point you can drive to. And then the tallest peak is over 10,000 feet. As in terms of elevation, that's actually not that high in the Rocky Mountains. I mean, Colorado has many peaks that are over 14,000 feet in elevation and much higher points that you can drive to. But the difference between the valleys and the peaks is dramatic and it provides just really, really beautiful, majestic scenery. The Continental Divide runs through the middle of Glacier National Park. The Continental Divide is kind of the rooftop of the country. Rain that falls on one side goes to the Pacific, rain that falls on the other side goes to the Atlantic and it runs right through the Glacier National Park. So really that kind of divides the park into two. It's almost like two parks. There's a west side and an east side. Uh, the park is about the size of Rhode Island, and it takes about two hours to drive from the west side to the east side over the very famous Going to the Sun Road. It was created in 1910. This was a whopping 40 years after Yellowstone. It's kind of interesting that it took so long to set aside Glacier as a park where Yellowstone was set aside back in the 1870s. And its nickname is the Crown of the Continent, given that nickname by this guy right here, George Bird Grinnell, who is uh, a real, an early famous naturalist, writer, and promoter of Glacier National Park. The west side is the most touristy part of the park. That's where most people enter. It's easier access from the freeway, where the east side is much more remote. But some people do complain about the west side being touristy, but that's all relative. There's plenty of other national parks that are way more touristy than West Glacier. But there are bigger towns by it, like Whitefish, Montana, and Kalispell. And there's places to rent, like kayaks and boats and things like that. A few more places to eat in Apgar Village. That's the west side. There's also North Fork on the west side, which is more remote. It's dirt roads, a um, lot, lot less visitors on the North Fork side. Okay, then there's the east side of Glacier National Park, which has three entrances. The main entrance is the St. Mary's entrance located in a little town called St. Mary's. The east side is much less developed and busy than the west side. The east side borders the Blackfeet Indian Reservation. And when you enter, you would be entering in on the Going to the Sun Road, and it would take you over the, the mountain pass there. There are two other valleys on the east side. One is called Two Medicine. 
that has its own entrance and and then is a dead end valley you go in there and you look at the lakes and do some hikes and things like that and then the other one is the very famous many glacier valley which again is is a dead end entrance you go in you look at the valley you do some hikes and if you're feeling really ambitious and want to see the entire park you can head north into waterton and waterton's in canada so you have to have your passport Waterton reminded me of a really great lake town. It was, I'd probably say the most touristy part of Glacier we went to actually. So there's a lot of restaurants there. They have this really cool hotel that looks like a castle. People can rent series and bikes and ride through town. So it's just a little bit of a different experience if you venture to Waterton. So we've covered really the five entrances and then Waterton's kind of a sixth entrance. Mm -hmm. Those are each of them really kind of have the same things to offer. That is a beautiful view with the lake and the mountains there. There's hikes, there's often boat rides in each of them. There are, sometimes there's horseback rides, there's lodging in most of them, there's a place to eat in most of them. So they all kind of offer the same things. All right, so next up is things to do. Glacier National Park is the most beautiful place on the planet, in my humble opinion. As you drive around the park, you'll just see, it's just effortlessly beautiful. There's wildflowers growing out of cracks in the road. There's waterfalls everywhere. When you arrive in each valley, you'll be standing there at the base of a lake with mountains on each side and a big U-shaped valley. This is something that anybody can do. That's what's great is that uh, some parts of the park are, are not really accessible. You're gonna have to hike to get to some of the really, really great sites, but anybody can just walk up to the lake and enjoy those beautiful U-shaped valleys. And I love to listen to the sounds there too. Sometimes it's so stunning with your eyes that you forget the other things like the smell of pines or the sound of birds chirping or waterfalls or the rivers. Just, oh, so amazing to all the senses. Glacier is a colorful place. It's really one of the things that stood out to us most on our recent trip there is that the colors are so beautiful. There's white bear grass, flowers, there's yellow flowers, there's red Indian paintbrush, there's of course white glaciers, there's green growth everywhere, green vegetation, there's turquoise lakes. I mean, even there's red rocks. Like, there's red rock a Glacier, which is kind of strange. And there is so much wildlife in Glacier. It's interesting because when you go to another park like Grand Teton or Yellowstone, where it's a lot of valleys, you have to really look for the wildlife. But at Glacier, you're in these canyons. And so the wildlife kind of comes to you. <laughs> They're everywhere. And I'd say this is the most likely place it is for you to see a bear. They are everywhere. Our good friend Linnea that helps us with glacier things. She's been a ranger there and she was going to count all the bears she saw her summer working as a ranger. And after 10, her first week, she stopped counting. She was done. And we saw quite a few on our last trip. But there's mountain goats, mountain sheep, marmots. I mean, you know, of course, the deer and elk everywhere and moose. The next thing is to get on the water. So I mentioned that there's lakes in all these valleys. Most of them offer boat rides. So you can do these boat rides that go across the lake. A lot of times you can go across the lake and then do a hike from there. So it kind of reduces the need to hike around the lake. You get to do a boat ride across the lake. They have these young tour guides that are pretty fun. They're out here for their dream summer and they, they'll share some information, give you guided tours. Um, you can also rent your own boat, a little motorized boat and ride that all around. We've done that a few times with mm -hmm. our kids and just us. And uh, so that's kind of a fun way to get out on the water as well. You can rent kayaks and paddle boards to get out there. And then you can just go swimming in any of the lakes or rivers that you want to. So when we were hiking the St. Mary Falls hike, we saw some people jumping into the water there. Mm -hmm. And uh, now keep in mind, the water's very cold. They probably average like 40 degrees or something <laughs> like that in the summer. You know, these are glacier lakes. So obviously they're very, very cold, but you can, you can swim, you can play in the water. There's a lot you can do there. We didn't get in, but we did meet a guy that enjoyed like the polar bear club and he liked getting in that water. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> oh, the lodges in Glacier National Park are incredible. Even if you don't get to stay in one, you should go see them because they're fancy. They're, and they're old. They're over, all over a hundred years old, built around 1912. And they're the Swiss style chalet. They actually, I think they really add to the beauty of Glacier National Park. I think a lot of times when we see National Park Lodges, they were built in the 60s and they're not really aesthetically pleasing, 
but these are beautiful and charming and they have flower baskets in the windows and I mean just really really cool structures they were built by the Great Northern Railroad to try to entice people to travel in the United States instead of heading over to Europe to see the Alps. The next thing to do is to hike. So if you're able to, you need to get out into those mountains and hike. That's where you're really going to see some of these super tall trees, these gorgeous um, gorges and rivers that flow through. You're going to see the wildflowers. Oh, wow. I mean, I think that the two best hiking national parks we've been to are Zion National Park and Glacier National Park. I mean, they, both of them, wow, just stunners. In fact, I think there's a lot of similarities between those parks, even though one's Red Rock and the other's mountains. You'll really be doing yourself a favor if you can even just get off into some of the trails. Some of our favorite trails were Avalanche Lake, uh, Running Eagle Falls. Which is, which is accessible, like handicap accessible. We always have our eyes open for that because like I said, I teach people with disabilities and then we travel with our retired parents. And so we're looking for things that may not be super difficult, that are still really enjoyable. And yeah, we and have- our kids. So and our kids. And our friendly kids. And elderly yes. friendly. So <laughs> we've got three generations traveling when we go places. Other ones, Grinnell Glacier Hike is one of the famous ones that get you up to a glacier. I mean, that's, that's on par with the Narrows in Zion or Angels Landing. Mm -hmm. That is just one of the best hikes we've ever been on. Really, really nice. Um, the other one is Red Rock Falls. That was a great one. And St. Mary Falls. Oh my gosh. Wow. We did a lot of hiking. I think when we went there, we hiked over 30 miles mm -hmm. and it was just amazing. It was, it was. <laughs> Although great. you don't have to be a big hiker to enjoy Glacier. I mean, right. hiking helps you enjoy it more. I definitely agree with that, but you can like, I kept thinking about my parents the whole time we were there. This last trip, it was just Matt and I, it was, we were celebrating our 20th anniversary and it was just a magical trip. But I kept thinking about my parents and we, we did, we hiked up to Grinnell Glacier, which is about a 7.6 mile hike if you cheat and take the boat ride. And, and I'm thinking my parents could do this. Like they need to take their time, but they could do this hike. And I'm, I'm really hoping they get to go see this because it is amazing. And like, I think it's the most beautiful hike I've ever been on. I loved it. Um, one other thing you can do though, if you're not super inclined to hike is to go on a red bus tour. These red bus tours are so cool. And there are these charming red vehicles and they look like they're right out of the 1920s, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. And, and right. they, they offer several of these red bus tours, like just to, from one point to another point, there's several offerings, but many of them go over the going to the sun road. And it's a good option if that drive scares you because the going to the sun road drive is a bit intimidating. There are some pretty steep, you know, when they, when they built the road, they had to kind of weigh, do we make this aesthetically pleasing or do we make it super safe? And I'm not saying the road's dangerous, but the the little barrier on the side of the road is not very tall. It's short. <laughs> and so it, that's a good option if you're not feeling comfortable driving over the going to the sun road is the red bus tour. And they also have, the Blackfeet also do a tour and their company's called the Rising Sun Tours. I think Sun Tours. Sun Tours. Yeah. So Red bus tours, sun tours, they both do going over the sun road. The other thing, just to know, while we're talking about the going to the sun road, that's one of the main things to do there in Glacier National Park is just simply to drive over that road. It's a memorable experience. One of the best and maybe one of the scariest drives that we've ever been on. Uh, it really is fantastic. And we've been on some absolutely amazing ones this year uh, over the last couple of mm -hmm. years, like uh, the Beartooth Highway and the Burr Trail. And, oh my gosh, <laughs> just so cool. Some of these drives that you can do out here. And it is a bit crazy. Like on the Going to the Sun Road, there's waterfalls flowing onto the road. It is crazy. I remember the first time going on that and, and I'll never forget it. I was just like, are we supposed to be on this road? Is this normal? And it totally is. Every time we've been there, there's been waterfalls going onto the road. So that mm -hmm. is just Glacier National Park. And we've done a whole nother video about what you need to know about driving to the going to the sun roads. So check that out. But speaking of waterfalls, that's kind of the next thing to do there in Glacier is to chase waterfalls. Maybe my favorite underrated hike in Glacier, which is St. Mary's Waterfall. Now the, the hike is popular, but you know, you don't hear about it quite as much as some of the other hikes. And I really, really enjoyed this hike. You actually get to three waterfalls on the hike. That whole hike was fantastic. You're going to see waterfalls everywhere you go. Just be warned, you might get waterfall fatigue actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so by the way, this video is part of a playlist. You want to check out our Glacier playlist when you're done with this. We have a bunch of videos about Glacier, going to the Sun Road, the hikes, all that stuff. All right, the next thing to do is to eat huckleberries. If you're hiking around, you're gonna see huckleberries and you can look up and see what huckleberries look like and they're really delicious. 
But if you don't want to search around for your own huckleberries, you can buy huckleberry anything. Taffy, licorice, jam, huckleberry bear claws. When we ate at the Charlie Russell's dining room, they actually had huckleberry trout. So you're going to get your fill of huckleberry if you visit Glacier National Park. One of the biggest challenges of visiting Glacier National Park is actually getting there. Because it's so remote, it's either a lot of driving or kind of an expensive flight. Um, the closest airport to fly into to visit Glacier National Park is Kalispell, which is about 45 minutes outside of the west entrance. Another option that people do is they might flow into Bozeman, Montana. Now, Bozeman's actually almost five hours away, but Bozeman is very close to Yellowstone, and a lot of times people will combine those into a trip. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, something that we didn't really know much about, but looks amazing, is you can take a train to Glacier National Park. Amtrak has a train called the Empire Builder. It goes through Glacier and it stops in East Glacier at the East Glacier Lodge, and it stops in West Glacier at the Belton Chalet. So one of the cool things is it'll stop and you're just within walking distance, you can hop right off the train and walk into the lodge and stay there. That is the way the early tourists to Glacier saw the park. The, the railroads really are the ones that built up the park and built those lodges and created a system to get people out there on the train. So that would be a cool way and you're getting through the Rockies and seeing some things that you're not seeing when you drive through the Rockies. So That's interesting cool. though, the hotels are just the right distance from the tracks because we stayed at both of those hotels and I don't recall ever hearing the trains, but a fun little tradition they have at the Belton Chalet is the guests stand on the decks and wave to the train as it arrives or departs. Now, of course, you can also drive to Glacier National Park. So as Cheryl mentioned, it's kind of far from anywhere, way at the top of Montana there. The west is big. You'll be on a big road trip if you're driving to Glacier. Just a couple of ideas for your road trips. You can do a Canadian Rockies road trip. So you visit Glacier and then you hop up into Waterton Lakes National Park, and then you go up into Banff and Jasper. We're actually just getting ready to release our Banff and Jasper travel guides right now. And so we're gonna take this road trip this year. Um, you can also do a Yellowstone, Grand Teton, and Glacier National Park road trip and hit those three northern U.S. parks. If you're coming in from the east, you can hit Medora, North Dakota, which is where Theodore Roosevelt National Park is. That's a, actually a really wonderful little like hidden gem, I, I would say. So. Like that is a total hidden gem that people should go visit. So if you're driving out from the east, definitely go check out Medora. And if you love Teddy Roosevelt, because mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. Yep, it's all <laughs> and about they have Roosevelt. they have a great they have a great nighttime program, like a not a play, like a sh it's a show, and it's wonderful with the beautiful mountains in the background. We love Medora. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're coming in from the east, consider stopping at Great Falls for a couple of uh, historical sites. They've got the Charlie Russell Museum and Art Gallery there. Uh, he was the most one of the most famous Western artists there was. Um, Cheryl loved this museum. Both of us loved it, but Cheryl didn't think she was going to love it. I, she loved it. I love this museum and I hate art. So that's what it <laughs> says about it. I was like, what? A museum of cowboy paintings? And then they just came to life and I fell in love with the Charlie Russell Museum. It was great. Cool thing about Charlie Russell is he has a connection to Glacier National Park because he used to go hang out in the lodge there. And now they have the dining room named Charlie Russell Dining Room. So he's got a connection there. And then the other thing you can do at Great Falls is visit the Lewis and Clark Center. So Montana has a lot of Lewis and Clark sites. This is a really nice museum to visit in Great Falls, Montana. If you're coming from the south, you could stop in Missoula, which has a whole host of things. We've done another video about Missoula. I'd encourage you to check that out. There's a few national park sites there like Grant Coors Ranch and the National Bison Range. Really a lot to do in Montana on the way. And then if you're coming from the west, you might stop in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Can you tell we like Montana? We lived there for a summer and we call it our magical Montana summer. Montana is so amazing. Yeah, we have a Montana playlist too, so check that out. <laughs> if you want to learn more about Montana. Next up is getting around. Getting around Glacier National Park does require a little bit of planning. One thing to know is that the going to the Sun Road isn't open the entire year, and it doesn't open at the same time every year. They have to get that road plowed off, which is quite a, a feat. Monumental <laughs> three-month feat to get that thing plowed. So you need to be checking the National Park's website to see when that road's actually open, but you can generally count on it being open July. Yeah. It might be mid-July. It, that's that's why going to Glacier is hard is because the that road's only open for a small part of the year and it can get covered in snow by mid-September some years and so it, that can be a bit of a challenge but I, let me interrupt real quick 
if the road is closed when you visit, like if you visit in June or something like that and it's not open yet, you can go from West Glacier over to the east side by going around the bottom of the park on Highway 2. The park is actually open all year round. Those entrances are open all year round, but it's that going to the sun road that's tricky. So. Mm -hmm. But we agree that you need a car when you go to Glacier National Park. But they do offer a shuttle system, and we've used shuttle systems in other national parks, and they work really, really well. But I don't think that they work very well in Glacier. Like they're small. The shuttle we rode on, we did ride the shuttle, only held 14 people. It came about every half hour. And so it would, you were kind of out of luck. Like if you were waiting on the side of the road to catch the shuttle and the shuttle was already full and no one got off, you're stuck there waiting for another half hour or hour or hour and a half. Um, I would not recommend using the Glacier Shuttles just because they're not super established like they are other places like Zion or Bryce. Let's talk about the reservations now that you're going to need in order to enter Glacier National Park. This is a common thing that the national parks are dealing with now is that they're trying to manage the crowds. So not only do you need to buy your park pass, which is $35 for a week, or if you get an annual pass, you can visit all the parks for $80. If you're a senior, you can get an $80 pass for the rest of your life. Uh, if you have a fourth grader, you can get a free pass. There's some things like that if you're a veteran. That's just, that's the cost to enter the park. But then Glacier also requires reservations. You actually have to get online and, on recreation.gov and obtain a reservation for the days you are going to visit. So all sections of the park now require a reservation. This is as of 2023. So these things change from year to year. This, this could change in the future, but going into 2023, all of those five valleys that I mentioned, those five entrances require reservations. They work a little differently. Like the going to the sun road is the west entrance and the St. Mary's entrance on the east side. If you have a going to the sun road reservation, it's good for three days. Um, the other valleys, like Many Glacier, Two Medicine, and North Fork, those are only good for a day. So if you want to visit those for more than one day, you're going to need to get more than the, the one reservation there. Um, the reservation system applies between 6 o'clock in the morning and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, this, that was the case this year, or sorry, 2022 when we visited. It, it started at 6 o'clock, the reservation did for the Going to the Sun Road. We stayed in the park at Lake McDonald Lodge and we were driving up to go to Logan Pass that morning and we started our drive at, I think, 6? Yes, we were up six early. 6 or 6.15 or something like yeah. that. We started super early and there was a line of cars going up there already, which meant everybody was entering in before 6 o'clock. So there was a bunch of people getting up really early and driving into the park. I imagine that'll be the case again this year. So you can do that if you want to. And just it was be aware chaos. it was, it was, it was wild yep and and so much so that when we got up to the top at logan pass that parking lot was already full that parking lot can fill up by six o'clock in the morning believe it or not but here's a little ninja tip for you mm -hmm. so three o'clock and after you don't need a reservation and that's actually a great time to go see the park because first of all glacier doesn't get that hot it tops out in the 80s in the middle of summer. That's the hottest it gets. Also, magical Montana summers, you have a lot of sunlight. Like we used to be blown away that 10 o'clock the sun was still up when we lived in Montana. And so those are a couple good things you have going for you. If you weren't able to get a reservation on the going to the sun road is that you can still enjoy a lot of the park after three o'clock. And most people are pretty ambitious. They get up before six and they're trying to get their way in if they don't have a reservation. I've noticed at other national parks things are mellowing out in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody thinks you need to hit it early. Um, no harm in hitting it later. Mm -hmm. Okay, one other thing to know about the reservation system is that if you have a reservation for a hotel, for a campsite, or for a commercial activity, such as a horseback ride or a boat ride, then you do not need to get one of those advanced reservations to enter that area of the park. It'll, it'll work for you. Okay, so what that, what that means is that if, if you're going to stay at Lake McDonald Lodge, then you don't need to get a pass to go on the Going to the Sun Road for that day that you're staying at the lodge. That's kind of one way maybe to get around the reservation system a little bit. I do want to give a word of warning or a little word of caution about this. The gal that we worked with to help make our guide, a friend that we've 
made who lived in Glacier for eight years and really knows the park inside and out. She worked as a boat captain there for a long time. And she told us that what a lot of people were doing were making reservations for a boat ride just so that they could get into that area of the park that day, but they had no intention of going on that boat ride at all and they just kind of stood them up. I would really encourage you not to do that. I think that's pretty rude. The tour companies really don't like it. They have talked to the park about not doing this system that way because it's really inconvenient for them that people do this. Sorry, I needed to give that little pitch because I do think it's extremely rude for people to go make a reservation just to no show. The other thing I wanted to make really clear is that having a reservation to one area of the park doesn't mean you can go to another. Like they have specific reservations for specific areas of the park. So for example, if you're staying at Lake McDonald Lodge that night, you can't go over to Mini Glacier without having a reservation for Mini Glacier. So once again, you can get online and they're inexpensive. They're about $2 per vehicle or per reservation. So they're not expensive, but you do have to get on and get those. And you need to make sure that you have them for the right days at the right time, which really makes it pretty important that you know where you're going which day. I think now, I feel it's a little sad that it's like this, but it's also true that the, our national parks have kind of turned into something that you do need to plan for. You need to get your lodging in advance and you need to know what you're doing what days, especially with this new reservation system. Just one other thing is that there are two windows to get the general reservations to get into the park. So they open up three months in advance on one window and then the other window is like a day before window. Um, we're not going to go into real heavy details on, on all that stuff. Just look for the information, the details on the National Park website, the official nps.gov website, and then also recreation.gov. So that is where you'll actually book it. So most of these national parks, they're now moving over to use this recreation.gov to manage campsites and these vehicle reservations and whatever else. So go to those sites for more details. And I just did want to mention too that we do sell an itinerary to go see Glacier that tells, like it's divided by days. And so it'd be really easy to just get that itinerary and be like, okay, we're going to Mini Glacier this day and Two Medicine this day. And that way you already know which day you're going to which place in the park. Okay, let's talk about how long to visit Glacier National Park. Our opinion here is three to five days probably, or three to six days actually. Because if you do six, five or six days, you're going to get to all the sections of the park plus Waterton. And it and that's what we did this year, and it was amazing. I mean, the anniversary trip mm -hmm. of our life, right? However, a lot of people will spend just one day in the park, literally just driving over the going to the Sun Road and then moving on with their lives. But in order to really kind of get around and see each valley, it's pretty much a day in each valley. The other factor to consider is how much of a hiker you are. Of course, hikes take time. And so if you're a big hiker, you may want to give yourself some time to go do those hikes. But if you're not interested in hiking, a couple of days, maybe three days, may be enough for you to see the park. Properly. All right, now let's talk about when to visit the park. So we mentioned early on that this has one of the shortest visiting seasons really because of that going to the Sun Road. July and August are the most popular months to visit and there are snow obstructions up until then. So when we went there, we went in August and we went on this Grinnell Glacier hike and we were fortunate because it had just barely opened. There was, there was enough snow there that they had just barely got it cleared in and in August. So. We were walking on some snow for some of that hike. And that's one of the crazy things about Glacier is that you're going to be dealing with some pretty extreme temperature swings, about 40 degrees plan on. So, you know, definitely dress in layers. The park is high and dry. So when you come out there, some people struggle with the elevation, you know, the altitude sickness. I've never seen anybody, but I have had at least one person comment to us that they they were struggling with that and they just had to leave and go to a lower elevation. And then and then it's dry. So, so like bring your chapstick, bring your lotion and moisturizer because even us Westerners feel dried out there. Okay, let's talk about where to stay. This is obviously a big question whenever you go visit anywhere um, is where to stay. So our opinion is to stay both on the west and the east side. I would stay in at least two different locations on your trip. Now, when Cheryl and I went there, we tried out all the lodges that were there. And so we stayed at a new place every night in each valley. And that was actually a very fun way to do it mm -hmm. as well. That was great. Uh, if you could do that, that, that would be wonderful. But at least, at least on the west and the east. Now, if you're one of these, you know, somebody who's like, I just want to stay in one place and then I'll 
drive a long distance each day. I'm fine with the driving. Then I would recommend staying in St. Mary on the east side, because if you stay in St. Mary, you have access to the going to the Sun Road to drive over to the west side and back, and then you're an hour away from any glacier and an hour away from Two Medicine. So let's talk about getting your own lodging in the national parks. Reservations for the in the park lodges start one year in advance. That's when you can start getting reservations and they actually do book up really early. As Matt said before, we stayed at six lodges within the national park on our last trip and it was kind of an ordeal to get reservations to all of those. You can plan on paying $200 and up for your nightly stay for a standard room. You're really paying for the ambience and the proximity to being closest to the coolest sites in the park. Now, would I recommend going to a National Park Lodge in Glacier? Heck yeah, it was great. We loved our stay. In fact, we wrote blog posts reviewing each one of the lodges so you can see which one's right for you. And we made a whole video about our experiences at the lodges, but our blog posts are on we'reontherockies.com. Okay, now the two best lodges, by the way, are Many Glacier Hotel and the Prince of Wales over in Waterton. Those are really memorable experiences. Um, so again, watch our video about those, but man, we love those experiences and they had the best views. So. And you don't need to be a guest to go enjoy those lodges. Like one of the best things that I liked about staying at those lodges was sitting in the lobby and looking out of the big windows down on the valley and um, seeing Grinnell Peak from Many Glacier or Waterton Lake below at, or at Waterton. It was really a cool experience. And even at Waterton, that's the best spot to view the Waterton Valley is from the um, Prince of Wales Hotel. And you see many, many people out there taking their pictures. Let's talk about camping real quick. Now, Cheryl and I have not camped in Glacier National Park. We have camped in many national parks and that's, that's <laughs> often the way we visit them. And one of the great things about camping is you do get that closer location. You're inside the park. And the campsites are pretty cheap. I mean, the National Park campsites are $22 a night or something like that. Um, now, Glacier has the big campsites are reservation only. They also have some first come, first serve campsites as well. The reservation ones open up six months in advance. Let me look at my notes here. I've got uh, seven first come, first serve campgrounds. And then new this year, reservations are available four days in advance. So meaning they have the six month window that opens up and then four days in advance, they open up some, some more for you. So a couple different ways to try to get that. Uh, again, we haven't camped there, but we do generally love National Park Service campgrounds. By the way, they have very, very few amenities. Okay, you're not getting like you don't want <laughs> RV to bring your, parks. You don't want to bring your Class A They're RV. Small. Yes. They're small. Most of these were built a long time ago before some of these massive um, campers and trailers, you know, were, were around. And so they're, they're small and they're simple. You can count on a fire pit, a picnic table. They'll have flushing bathrooms, but like it's just cold water in there in the sink to wash your hands. Uh, no plugins or anything like that. Uh, there are a couple of campgrounds that do offer showers. I think. Let me. I yeah, took, two of them. I think. Many Glacier and the Rising Sun campgrounds offer showers for a little fee. Also, final pitch here is that they do have amphitheaters and ranger programs at night. And these are some of our favorite things to do. The rangers are always so well presented. I swear, I've never heard a ranger say, um, before. I mean, it's <laughs> crazy. They are so well presented. They have their presentation down. And this last time we went to the Many Glacier campground to watch Ranger Benson give a program on the wildlife in the park. And it was fascinating so great like they are always so good and you don't have to be staying in the campground to go there we highly encourage that we love them so where to eat at the major lodges you can plan on three types of restaurants they've got coffee shops grills and fine dining coffee shops are great that's kind of like gas station food you can get a slice of pizza or a breakfast burrito the grills or burgers. A lot of the grills do serve some things that are served in the fine dining and you're actually gonna pay the same price, but it might be their lunch menu. And then, then of course the fine dining experiences, which are going to cost you at least $30 and up. They serve local fare like the Huckleberry Trout or Bison. Um, also one nice thing to know is these, all these places do have vegan options. If you're not into meat, the national parks kind of support people that don't like that. And so that's a good option. I like to get the vegan options a lot of times but you can plan on those things. The fine dining experiences, I really like because you get a view. Most of the dining rooms in the major lodges 
have an amazing view of the valley and the lake and the mountain behind it. And so you're getting to eat some delicious food and you're getting to see some beautiful views while you eat. And I just think that's why we travel these thousands of miles to get to these parks is to get these views. And the more of those views we can get on our trip, the better. So some of the favorite fine dining places uh -huh. um, is the Charlie Russell Fireside Dining Room. We, we mentioned this earlier, but this is in Lake McDonald Lodge. Uh, named after Charlie Russell, the artist, and it's kind of an old log cabin type of a feel. And that is that is actually the room where he hung out in and would paint and tell stories and things like that. Yeah. And so there's pictures of Charlie Russell there. And don't miss the carrot ginger soup. Oh, yeah. That was that really was good. The, best. <laughs> the Ptarmigan Inn, the Ptarmigan Dining Room at Many Glacier Hotel. That's, I think, the, the highest end fine mm -hmm. dining in the park, right? And that has that beautiful view of, of the lake and the mountains out the window. Um, when we were there, I have regret, okay, because when we were there, we didn't go to dinner at the Ptarmigan Inn. We did breakfast, and they had like a breakfast buffet, and, and it was fine. It was okay. Nothing probably too special. For dinner, they were serving duck, and I wish I had sprung the money for dinner, but the breakfast was a lot cheaper, and, you know, we're usually not up for like spending a ton of money on food. We just kind of wanted the experience, mm -hmm. but I do have a little regret that I didn't do the the duck. They don't do reservations, so you have to get there early, get in line if you want a place there. And then one more dining experience that Cheryl can talk about. Oh, so the Prince of Wales in Waterton. This is the hotel. It looks like a castle. They do an afternoon tea, and it is so fun. I mean, the Waterton, the Waterton Hotel is, ooh, I don't know, Waterton or Mini Glacier. I'm not sure which one's better. They're both super cool. Mm -hmm. But the view from the Waterton, from the Prince of Wales Royal Dining Room where they have tea time is awesome and it's really a fun experience because you know we're americans and we don't have tea time but it was fun to have like a real tea time experience with a beautiful view and we loved it piano going yeah the piano going fresh flowers on our table it was fantastic mm -hmm. even though some of these are some pretty high-end dining establishments they don't have a dress code so if you've been hiking all day you're okay to go in your hiking boots although i was really glad that i I packed a, a dress that didn't wrinkle up that I could wear to our tea time in Waterton. Let's talk about more affordable options for you to eat uh, because not, you're not going to have every meal at the fine dining places. So I actually thought the best value in the park were some of the grills. Uh, 80s Cafe is in Apgar. Apgar Village on the west side. And you can go out on the deck and eat your hamburger and look at Lake McDonald. That was wonderful. And Apgar Village had a nice little uh, atmosphere about mm -hmm. it and people milling around and getting their water, uh, you know, their, their stuff to go out on the lake and all that, their kayaks. It, that was fun. I liked it. And then I actually thought the best place was Two Dog Flats, which is near St. Mary Lake. That had great views of the mountains out the windows. We had delicious huckleberry pie, of course, more huckleberry, <laughs> and a pork sandwich. Like, I thought, I thought that was fantastic. So those are some more affordable ones. Oh, and then Nell's. Nell's Cafe or whatever is located in the Swift Current Motor Inn. And I had like a barbecue or a cowboy mac and cheese or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was actually really good too. So for me, the best bang for the buck is actually the grills. Finally, we are big fans of picnics. We do pack picnics when we go visit the national parks all the time. This last trip, we actually ate out a lot, mostly so we could review them for you um, and to kind of get the experience and all that. But uh, we usually pack picnics and we like that because you don't always know when you're going to be close to a lodge or there might be long lines. You might need reservations, whatever. So we, we do like packing the picnics and um, so I yes. highly recommend that. And when we travel with our kids, we generally try to do one fine dining experience for the whole trip. It's kind of fun to teach the kids some manners and let them have a nice experience that way. But yeah, the rest of the trip we're pretty casual and generally in the morning we're wanting to get up and go hiking. So a lot of times it's like a bowl of cereal from our lodge. Like we'll just <laughs> have stuff in a cooler and get going. One more tip about eating in the park. One of the famous things to do is to drive to Pole Bridge, which is in the North Fork area. The Pole Bridge Mercantile, also called the Merc, is a really cute little building and store and, and all that. And they have a little saloon there next to it. That, that is kind of fun to go there. That's really but, all there is in Pole Bridge. It's like two buildings and a hostel. Like it's, Yeah, a little hostel. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's not much there, um, which is maybe the appeal of it. But a lot of people drive up there just for the Huckleberry Bear Claws, <laughs> which are famous. And so uh, we had to go get a huckleberry bear claw and it was not that good. <laughs> it was kind of soggy. So <laughs> if you like soggy pastries, 
then go to Pole Bridge. If you don't, then uh, you don't you don't need to go there just because everybody else is saying go there. Yeah. So if you want to get picnic supplies, though, you can go to St. Mary's and West Glacier has grocery stores. So those are some good spots to pick up your groceries if you're wanting to pack some picnics. If you want to see the restaurants, we did a whole nother video reviewing all those restaurants. So check that out. Okay, up next, let's talk about what to pack for your trip. So we're going to cover some products here that you might want to consider bringing with you. Now we do, we have the links to these products in the description underneath the video here. And if you click on those and you buy them from our link, it does give us a little bit of a commission. It doesn't cost you anything. These are just some ideas for you. We want to help you have a great trip. And these are some things that we have really enjoyed yeah. on our on our trips. So, and, and these are actually all things that we've purchased ourselves after researching that we've used and loved. First recommendation that I really highly recommend is getting binoculars, bringing binoculars on your trip. Average binoculars are around $200. Uh, these are a little cheaper. This is Carson. Okay. The brand is Carson and uh, these are 10 by 42. Now, some people will say, what, what, what size of binoculars should I get? You know, what, what the zoom level and all that. And I'm not a binocular expert. I just know that when you use binoculars at these parks, it makes a world of difference. These ones, these ones are great and they're just a little bit cheaper, I think. Um, but when you see a bear over on the other side and you pull out your binoculars, it makes a world of difference. And I like them even for nature. You know, if you're looking clear across the valley and you look in binoculars, it really changes what you're seeing quite a bit, in my opinion. Okay, what else you got? Okay, next up I have some hiking pants. These are Columbia and I love them. I feel like I used to be a cave woman rubbing sticks together and not using a lighter to make fire. These have been amazing. I can wear them when it's hot outside or cold. I can roll them up and they don't wrinkle, they don't stain, they resist water. They're super comfortable. I love these. Okay, I'm going to jump in here with my clothing item that I really enjoy, which is this vest. It's a Scott E. vest, I think. Scott E. vest. So again, all the links are in the description if you want this. I have been surprised. I'm not really like, I'm not into having gear and clothing really. And I have loved this vest because when you go out into the national parks, really anywhere in the Rockies here, they're high elevation. And so in the morning, it can be pretty chilly afternoon pretty warm so I like having this vest it has really made a huge difference I wear it all the time hiking and I don't get boiling hot in it and it has a bunch of pockets for a lot of my you know my phone wallet keys all that stuff I cannot emphasize this enough for Glacier take your bear spray or buy some when you get there if you're going on a plane bear spray is not allowed on planes but I I have never been in a national park where I'm more scared of a bear encounter than I am in Glacier Matt and I were hiking on the Red Rock or the Red Falls Trail and we encountered two bears and the, this was not a heavily, this was like a two miler. It wasn't like a big out back country trail, but we came across two bears and one of them followed us and I was so <laughs> glad I had my bear spray with me. I was glad we didn't have to use it, but I was really grateful to have that. I think a lot of times when you go to national parks, if you stay in the populated areas, you're not going to run into a bear and you don't need to carry it around. But in Glacier, I think you should, always. <laughs> and everybody that we saw had it. Now, a couple things about that real quick. First of all, we've done a whole video on bear spray where we tested out three kinds of bear spray if you wanna see us. Suffer. Suffer because <laughs> the fumes and all that, we were gagging ourselves. Um, the other thing is, one of, what, what was nice about that is that we were actually able to practice spraying the bear spray. So we had a lot more confidence with it when we saw the bear, just mm -hmm. in case we needed to use it. And uh, I was showing you earlier, this is the little thing to pull off. Um, and then you spray it there and do not accidentally spray the bear spray. We were on a boat ride at Glacier and somebody accidentally discharged their bear spray and gassed the boat. And she was so embarrassed and mortified <laughs> and everybody was gagging and coughing and running out to the bow of the, the bow of the boat to get some fresh air. To, if you pack it around, you can put it on a little belt holster like this thing here. And then do not accidentally discharge that. Have that clip on there at all times. Yeah. Um, if you go on a boat, I would put it in a bag so you don't accidentally, you know, spray it. And then when we saw the bear, um, we saw like three bears while we were hiking. And these bears, I mean, I think they're used to seeing people. The park, if there was an aggressive bear, the park would know about it. And they actually try to tase them and, and train them to avoid the humans. But... Even so, when this bear was right there in the path and he wouldn't get out of the way, we, 
<laughs> we, were, we were like, okay, we had a plan. I'm going to get big and growl, and she's going to spray the bear spray if this thing attacks us. So we had our, we had our little plan going, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, so you should have a plan, too. Just, <laughs> just be comfortable. Know how to use bear spray. Make sure you have a bottle with you. And most of the bears you're going to encounter are black bears. We only saw a grizzly in Waterton. So you're most likely going to see a bear, and you may encounter one while it's just the two of you on a hiking trail. So have your bear spray. Yep. Okay, what else you got? Oh, well, you have the sharing shack on here. Oh, you know, I'm just throwing this out there. I saw somebody online said there is a sharing shack in Columbia Falls on the west side, which uh, is like a community thing. You can go borrow the cooler for the day, use it for your groceries, and then put it back. Bear spray. They have bear spray in the community shack. I don't know anything about it other than they have a Facebook group on it, so you might want to consider doing that. Every time we travel to a national park, I always want to wear my trail running shoes because I think they're great for most hikes. But my vote for Glacier is to wear your hiking boots. There are a lot of uneven rocks. The ground can be pretty muddy and wet. So I would say Glacier is a wear your hiking boots park. And I did not. I wore my tennis shoes like I always do. Uh, hiking poles. You know, a lot of people really like the hiking poles, particularly the adjustable ones. I haven't gotten a pair yet, but I think it might be about time. Oh, so, because yep. <laughs> I've actually tripped and fallen on a couple couple places. So hat and sunscreen. Uh, again, even though you're in the mountains and the weather's cooler, you can surprisingly get burned by the sun when you're out there. Yeah. So just, you, just be aware. If you watch our video, like of our big trip, you'll see our skin gradually get redder <laughs> because we're getting sunburned. But um, one thing you don't need is bug spray. There's not a lot of bugs in Glacier. I mean, those might be famous last words. Get on and let me know if you've had a bad encounter with bugs, but we didn't have any problems with bugs in Glacier. It's like the perfect national park. Flowers growing out of cracks in the road and no bugs. Yeah. Okay, we're just throwing this out there. You might want to consider bringing toilet paper. So on some of the hikes, they'll have like a pit toilet uh, on, the, on the way or near the end of the hike that you can go use the restroom. So that's really nice. But they generally don't have toilet paper. At least when we were there, they didn't. So I don't know. You might want to consider packing some toilet paper in your backpack in case something like that comes up. Yeah, and they're not getting cleaned either. Just no, it's very primitive, primitive restroom facilities while you're on the trail. At the trailheads, they're okay, but it's once you're out on the trail. But you are grateful to at least have that option if you need to go. Yep. Oh, this is one of my little pro travel tips. Um, on a big long road trip, it's actually for the ladies, it's actually kind of comfortable to wear a dress. Um, not like a short dress or a low cut dress, but like something that's below the knee. So comfortable. I really, now when we go on a road trip, I wear a dress. We, we visited Italy last year and Cheryl was inspired by the Italians. I was by the Italian women. <laughs> They're all in their comfortable dresses. They looked beautiful and they were comfortable. And I'm like, us American women need to pick that tip up. There's a Utah based company called Minky Couture. Minky blankets are incredible. There is nothing in the world softer than a Minky blanket. And when I saw this one, it made me think of the ice caps of Glacier. And I actually reached out to this company to partner with them because I like their products so much, but I also like them because they hired one of my students with a severe special need to help them in their warehouse. And he loved it. The people there were so kind to him. I love Minky and they did make us a deal that if you, if you put in the code Rockies 45, you will get 45% off your Minky. So anyway, I, I do, I love my Glacier Minky. Okay, let's talk about how much a trip to Glacier National Park costs. So every, everybody's expense is gonna vary, of course, depending on how you get there. I just wanna cover this a little bit so you have a ballpark idea of, of what we spent on our on mm -hmm. our trip there. So you can plan on spending about $150 to $300 a night for a hotel. So for our five day trip, that was about $1,000 for lodging, right? Yep. And now the this is what kind of one of the cool things is those in-park lodges, I always thought they were, I always thought the lodges inside the national parks were kind of expensive. And a lot of times they are a little more expensive than, than places outside the park. But they're dirt cheap compared to the Canadian places. <laughs> Canadian national parks are outrageous. We're going to Banff this year and it costs uh, $1,500 a night to stay in the Fairmont Chateau, the Banff Springs Hotel or the Lake Louise Hotel. Anyway, so is, that is actually kind of cool because the national park does... I think control those prices. Those mm -hmm. lodges, I'm sure, could charge a lot more. But anyway, it is fairly affordable to stay yeah. in the park. And they do have some more budget options. Like they have motor inns, which are cheaper, and then they have like the fancy the fancy lodges like Mini Glacier. Um, just one thing I didn't mention about the lodges earlier. If you are staying at an in-the-park lodge, you need to know that 
even though the lobby is going to be amazing, the rooms are very basic. They're very rustic. You've got no TV, no AC, no Wi-Fi. <laughs> Yeah, you're staying there for the experience yes. and not for the, yeah. If you and, want amenities, go outside the park. Yeah, no fridges, no microwaves, no pools, nothing like that. But I still think they're worth a stay. And they will say you have Wi-Fi, but it's like if you stand on your head with a hanger, you might get a little bit of Wi-Fi. Yeah. It's not great. Prince of Wales was, the one in Canada, was mm -hmm. the most expensive lodge that we stayed at over $300 a night. Okay, now you can save a lot of coin by doing camping. So I mentioned that in the park camping is $22 a night. So wow, that's that's it's a like big a, change. Yeah, $100 <laughs> versus 1,000, pretty big change. Yeah. Um, per meal, like if you're eating just at a grill for lunch, you can count on a burger costing about 20 bucks. Like by the time you get fries with it and stuff like that, if you're staying, if you're going to a fine dining, at least $30 and up. So we spent, what did we spend? figures spent around $500. Now we ate out twice per day. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we kind of had a little goal to do that, to, to learn what there was and to, to share it with you. We wouldn't normally do that. We'd probably eat out once a day maybe. But anyway, we spent around $500 for that. The boat rides cost about $30 per person per ride. And there are four boat rides in Glacier. And then there's a Waterton ride, which is actually more expensive. I think that one was $60 per person. Of course, the Canadian stuff was funny. So it's all more expensive. But um, now we actually did a bunch of boat rides again, so we could, you know, learn what they were like. If you're going there, I would say one boat ride is, is sufficient. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would be $30. Maybe two, depending on kind of what your activities are and what what you're trying to do there but uh, yeah because a lot of times you utilize the boats to shortcut your hikes if you don't want to do a lot of mileage you might want to do a boat ride to do that a red bus tour costs between 60 and 120 dollars per person mm -hmm. there for the tour so again if you're going to do that take that into consideration we did not do that but that would be if there's two of you you know around 200 dollars or something like that a family is going to be a lot more the Good. park passes, pretty cheap. The national parks are, are affordable to visit, so $35 for a week for a car. That's not per person. That'll get your whole family in there. Uh, and then $80 for a pass that, that covers all national parks for a year. Okay, so in the end, we spent a total of about $2,000 for a week long trip to Glacier. So um, a lot cheaper than Disney World. That's right. <laughs> Taking our family to Disney World, <laughs> but a little spendy. And again, we were a little on the high end because we were staying in those lodges and eating out more than we normally would have. So, so you could certainly do it a lot cheaper. Okay, let's talk about general tips now. Just cover gen some general tips real quickly here. Um, first of all, leave the dogs at home. Dogs aren't allowed on. I don't think any of the trails. If they are, it's not very many of them. In the mountains, in the Rockies, because of bears and the other wildlife. Most of these parks do not want you bringing the dogs. They're not allowed. Um, I know that I know that they're a part of your family, but you'll have a, a better trip if you leave that dog at home. Now, you know, if, if you want to bring it, just realize you're not going to be able to go visit some of the places that you normally. Well, a good would. rule of thumb is you can take a dog to the same places you can take your car, if like right. that kind of. So if you're if you're seeing the park from your car, that's fine. But if you're wanting to get out and go places and. The national parks do allow trained service animals, but not emotional support. So just know the difference right. and, right. and just know even a trained, even a trained dog could be at risk just because of the wild animals around there. So, right. yeah. The visitor centers are nothing to write home about. So they, they just don't have very, very big fancy visitor centers. We're big fans of going to the visitor centers. So when we, when we arrive at a national park, we always go straight to the visitor center. We can ask the ranger questions. We get a junior ranger booklet. They often have a movie that you can watch that's really nice. Maybe you uh, pick up a souvenir or whatever. They have like that passport book where you can stamp it to show that you've been to that place that day. Call that the National Parks Passport. So we do like going to the visitor centers. Oftentimes they have the ranger programs. You can find out when they are that day. They might be at the visitor center or somewhere else. All that's great. But some visitor centers have really nice exhibits and movies and stuff like that. Not Water really Tins, in Glacier. Oh, Waterton's yes. Visitor Center is good. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That so, was very nice. So, like, if you're doing the big trip, maybe skip the ones in Glacier, but go to the Waterton one, because that one is one of the best ones I've seen. Yes, that was great. Okay, the signage in the park is not the best. It kind of surprised me, because I feel like the national parks have really upped their game on clearly marking it, making it easy for people to find their way around, but I found Glacier to be a bit confusing to drive around, to be honest. 
And Matt's really good at that kind of stuff. And even yeah. once in a while, we were kind of like, Ooh, you a know, looking trails. at our maps. And of yeah, course, a few trails that weren't marked very well. Yeah, and of course, you know, the Wi-Fi, your cell phone, none of that is going to be working while you're driving around. It was kind of a hard trip to leave our kids home on because we couldn't communicate with them. They had good caretakers here, but it was a little stressful to not have great access to calling home. So just know you're off, you're off the grid in Glacier. Be flexible. So closures happen often. There's snow, there's water, there's uh, wildlife. There's a lot of things that can really kind of throw off your plans a little bit. Again, we got up super early to go up to Logan Pass thinking we were going to be the crowds and we did not be the crowds. So you just have to be flexible. Go well, roll with the punches. It wasn't the end of the world. We just moved on, went, did another hike. It was great. Well, and the Hidden Lake Trail, which is one of the really popular ones, it was closed because of a snow bridge that they needed to take down. Like it, and that's, that's what we noticed a lot when we were there this last time is there are closures, like there might be a bear in the area or the snow's not melted. So, but I think the thing to know is that Glacier is so beautiful everywhere that even if you miss something, you're going to see something else cool. One more thing I wanted to mention is, is to be flexible about the services that are available. As we all know, um, everybody's got a staffing shortage right now. And these, these parks are no different. These concessionaires, the businesses, all that stuff, they're getting slammed. So be, be nice to the employees. We made, we made kind of friends with a couple of the employees there. Some of these young kids that were, that were there for the summer, just having the summer of their dreams. You don't want to go <laughs> trashing them and making them feel miserable. You know, usually they're trying very hard and they, they just be nice to the employees and the Rangers, the Rangers short staffed always. So, but I have to say though, I did not see one unhappy tourist in Glacier on our last trip. Everyone was all smiles. They were happy to be there. So I think they got a 10 on the polite behavior all around. Everyone is really happy and nice. That's awesome. Boat rides, just a few things to know about the boat rides. So we actually did a whole nother video about the boat rides, but we want to give you just a few tips right here. Cause we rode all of them. We rode all, we them. Rode yeah. all the boats. <laughs> yeah. So there are five of them, including the Waterton Lakes one. They all accept advanced reservations. So if you know about what time you're going to be there, then go ahead and get an advanced reservation. Some of the rides have guided hikes. So they'll take you to the end of the lake and then you'll get off and do a hike with the tour guide and they'll tell you about some things. So that was kind of nice. We did one of those, practically like a free tour, you know, it comes with the boat ride. I think my favorite one was actually probably Waterton because the boat was bigger and it went farther and you crossed from Canada into the United States and you could actually see the line where they had plowed down all the trees. They cut down all the trees there along the border of Canada and the US. So I actually probably like that one the most. And I like the mini glacier one. You got to go on a couple different boats. It shaves a lot of time off of your hike. And I just, I just, I'm kind of crushing on mini glacier. I love it so much. It, yeah. yeah, you can't go wrong there for sure. So anyway, watch our video about boat rides as well. Okay. okay and then the final tip is that cell service and Wi-Fi is really poor in Glacier National Park. Cell service is pretty much non-existent. And even if you go to some of the lodges there, the Wi-Fi is really bad at the lodges. So you want to make sure that you have your plan downloaded or printed so that you have something offline because you're not going to be able to have access to your phone too much in the park, which kind of gets us to our next point here. If you're watching this video, you are probably the trip planner for your family or your group that you're traveling with. And with that comes quite a bit of pressure. And I'm familiar with that because I'm usually the trip planner when I'm planning our family vacations, there's a lot to take in. Our mission is to help you have a great trip to the West. So we have created an itinerary for you so that you can see the best of Glacier National Park. And so that you're not having to go all over the web and try to scour the web for information and try to piece it all together on your own because it's quite a bit. And uh, so we have put it all in one place for you here in this guide. Now we've written many guides to places around the West and we've grown up here in the West and visited these places our whole lives. Glacier we hadn't visited quite enough to feel real qualified to write a guide on our own for that park. So what we did is we reached out and we found somebody, a, a really talented young lady named Linnea who had lived in Glacier National Park for eight years. In fact, she was a boat captain there for a while. And so she helped us is we used our guide writing skills and her knowledge of the park to create a plan to help you be the hero of your family. And what you get when you get our itinerary is you get five days worth of activities to do in Glacier National Park, 
four on the American side, one in Waterton. And every day you're going to have a plan for every morning, afternoon, and evening with activities. And it will tell you how to do the activity, how long it will take, how long it will take you to get to the next one, and kind of the rigor involved in those activities so you know which one is for you. Plus, detailed maps of how to drive to all those locations. This really is like all you need to get ready to go on your trip. We always just print ours off, pack it in a binder, and look at it every day to know what we're going to do. Now you might be wondering if it works for you in your situation. So I can assure you, as we mentioned earlier, we travel with multiple generations. We've got our, our children. We're middle-aged now, unfortunately. <laughs> and then our parents are in their 60s and 70s. And so we're really aware of you know, designing this for to work for all people. So even if we suggest a really long hike, like a seven mile hike, we'll have backup options for you if you're not a hiker. And we've been doing this for a couple of years. We've sold thousands of these guides, but every year we get hundreds of emails from people that have just loved their trip and they've told us how much they've been able to do because they had a plan. But one thing that comes with this itinerary is Matt's amazing audio guides. He's written several audio guides to other national parks in the West and they always come with their itineraries. And he's almost done with this glacier one. So by the time you see this video, it'll probably be done. But his audio guides are what people especially love. They're made in 15 minute sections. They tell very interesting stories. Glacier has a very rich history with all sorts of really fun stories to really make that time go by and they're great for all ages. This is kind of my pride and joy, my passion. In fact, last year when we were at the Prince of Wales Hotel in Waterton, one woman recognized us from my voice. So we were there in the lobby together. She heard, she overheard me talking to Cheryl and came over and said hi to us. She had recognized us because she had got our guides for Yellowstone, Grand Teton, and Glacier. And for the last two weeks, they had been traveling around those parks and listening to my audio guides. So they came over and said hi. It was really special for us. Just a great honor to meet some people who we were able to help travel through the parks. For less than the price of a meal at Tarmigan's, you can have our itinerary in your hand in just a couple of minutes. Just go to our website, we'reintherockies.com, buy the guide, download it, print it if you like, and you are all set. Hopefully we'll see you in the park soon. Go download the guide right now. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.